Hey everybody and welcome to week two. I hope you had a good first weekend and you're ready for another week. All right, so I just wanted to um, tell you a quick story here that's going to make a little bit more sense later in the semester when we cover um, something. But um, on this day in um, 1953, actually, if this day is ex uh, tomorrow, it's September 1st, if you're viewing this on that day, then on this day in 1953, this uh, brash, young-looking man here did something really terrible to this young, fine-looking man. Um, this is Dr. William Scoville, and in, uh, in, in his defense, in, in an in a, in a, in a attempt to help this guy, his name is Henry Mollison, um, who an attempt to help him with seizures that he was suffering on a, on a daily basis. Um, he did a radical surgical procedure, and this was back in the era when um, psychosurgery was kind of a hot up and coming thing to do. It's a dark chapter in our history of psychology. Um, you've probably heard of frontal lobotomies. Um, this was a, you know, a, a, a thing that, a, um, many people thought was a helpful um, therapy. Uh, it turned out to be a disaster. Well, he did something similar. He gave um, he gave Henry um, what's called a hippolectomy, and um, he did this on this day in 1953 when Henry was in his uh, oh, I can't remember. He was about your age in his early mid twenties. Um, the hippocampus is Latin for seahorse, and it's this red structure in these images here, at sort of the center base of the brain stem, and uh, the bottom of the cortex, and, and uh, uh, it's Latin for seahorse because, as you can see here, uh, when you kind of take it out, <laughs> if you take it out and uh, put it in just the right way, it looks like a seahorse, all right? Well, um, uh, Scoville went in there and drilled a couple of, this is nasty, drilled a couple of uh, holes in Henry's forehead and went in there with a little tiny, um, you know, vacuum of sorts and, and slurped out uh, a good portion of the hippocampus and some nearby tissue out of, out of, his, uh, out of his brain. So, you know, in a normal brain, these are the areas where it would be. And in Henry's brain, you can see that it is missing. This is an MRI taken of Henry while he was still alive in the 90s, I believe. Um, well, so what happened with this? Um, you're about to see. So let me introduce to you something that we'll cover when we have a chapter on memory in more detail. But um, next week when we cover... Um, the brain in more detail. Some of this will also make some, some, some have some relevancy there. So let me play this little video clip here to let um, so you know more about patient HM, who that that was how we knew him while he was alive from 1953 until he died in uh, about tw 12 years ago or so. Uh, in his 80s, and he was studied extensively, as you're about to see, all right? So we learned an awful lot about memory from this terrible procedure that was done to him as a young man. So let me play this for you. Most of us hold in our minds memories of our lives so vivid that when we recall them, they seem real and indelible. They're an essential part of who we are. But as we explore the mechanics of the brain, we're starting to learn exactly what these memories are made of. And it turns out, a lot of it boils down to chemistry. As correspondent Chad Cohen reports, researchers are discovering the precise molecules that can create memories, as well as the molecules that can erase them forever. This is the brain that more than any other in history has allowed scientists to make sense of your brain. For 82 years, it resided in the head of a man named 
Henry Gustav Mollison, better known as H.M. He was perhaps the most studied patient ever. And that didn't end when he died last year. With H.M.'s permission, neuroanatomist Jacopo Anese went to work dissecting his brain into 3,000 slices. You can imagine the brain being like a book, and our tissue slices are the pages of this book. The only catch is the slices are transparent, so you cannot really see anything until you use a lot of obscure chemical processes to reveal the features in the tissue. Eventually, the entire book will be completely stained, and it will tell us the story of this brain. It's a story that begins with epilepsy, epilepsy so severe that by 1953, H.M. had reached his breaking point. He had to stop working because of the frequency of his seizures. It was just too dangerous. So he was basically at home with his parents. His life was on hold. In desperation, H.M. let surgeon William Scoville remove slivers of brain on either side of his head, each containing a seahorse-shaped structure called a hippocampus. This might have seemed reasonable at a time when we knew almost nothing about memory. And it did quiet his seizures, though at a terrible cost. Do you know what you did yesterday? No, I don't. How about this morning? That, I don't know myself. I can't tell you because I don't remember. H.M.'s condition might have seemed like simple dementia. But as neuroscientist Brenda Milner discovered, it was anything but. He would say, right now it's like waking from a dream. Right now everything is clear. But what happened just before? Milner found that H.M. had a normal IQ. He could crack jokes, solve puzzles, even, to some extent, remember. So H.M. could remember everything that happened prior to the operation. He could remember the traumata of his childhood. He could remember going to elementary school, to high school, working in the assembly plant. What he couldn't do was hold on to new information for more than a few minutes. In a moment of insight, Milner concluded the hippocampus must make long-term memories out of short-term ones. That was a groundbreaking finding because it showed that the ability to establish long-term memories is localized to this tiny area in the brain. If H.M. had contributed nothing more, his fame would have been assured. But he would go on inspiring discoveries for decades. The next involved a pencil, a mirror, and again, Brenda Milner. She did this brilliant test in which she had H.M. draw the outlines of a star without looking at the star, but looking into a mirror. It's hard at first to draw within the line, but could H.M., like people with normal memory, learn to do it with practice? After three days and 10 trials, his performance was nearly perfect. Well, he said, I thought this would be difficult, but it looks as though I've done pretty well. He had no memory of all these learning trials that he had been through and the beautiful learning. And that was the real contrast. So, H.M. could remember a motor skill, but not recall a fact or an event. It was a key discovery because it showed there were different kinds of memory dependent on different parts of the brain. But what is a memory anyway? Nerve cells communicate by sending electrical signals, which trigger the release of chemicals across tiny gaps called synapses. As one cell speaks to another, chemical changes at the synapse make it easier for the signals to pass. If only a few signals are sent, this transformation among a network of cells is temporary, resulting in a short-term memory. But if the signals keep coming, changes at the most active synapses become permanent, forming a long-term memory. 
So long-term memory actually involves an anatomical change in the brain. So as I like to say, if you remember anything about this conversation tomorrow, it's because you will have a slightly different head than you had today. But what maintains a long-term memory? How can you recall something? Okay, that's where I'm going to end that. Um, so, yeah, I just wanted to introduce that to you. And um, amazing story, isn't it? Amazing case. So we're going to learn more about uh, Henry in our chapter about memory. And, um, and I'll probably have more to say about my buddy there, Jacopo, an essay um, another time. So uh, enjoy, the, enjoy the chapter um, this week. Uh, we're still on chapter one. And um, you have, uh, by now I hope and trust that you have Launchpad figured out and registered and so on and did the first couple of introductory assignments. And a, a bunch of you have already um, jumped in and taken the first chapter quiz. So um, if you have not yet done all these things, I trust that you did everything in the, uh, in the chapter zero introduction page already. And um, if you go into chapter one page, um, I've got loads of stuff for you to do and to read here, all right? So um, um, I, I have, I, every chapter will have additional content like this, being an online course. I'm, I, I do have um, other things for you to, to um, do besides mind ta uh, be the launch pad stuff and um, reading the chapters. So there are some other videos that will be, um, up, up that are here. And I, I, I think you're going, I know you're going to enjoy these. I, I, very fascinating stuff. So some chapters have more things to do than others. So plan accordingly. There's a pretty good amount of stuff I have for you to watch here. And the exams can and do contain questions from these videos. So um, do watch them. All right, and um, you'll see that I also put in PowerPoints. So I put in the, the publisher's PowerPoints, and then I also include PowerPoints for, um, that I use when I teach in person and in some of the videos that, that, that I do have. All right, there will also, you can, and you can view those things here, or you can download them and look at them. Some of them are huge because they contain videos like the one I just played. And um, that makes for big files. So um, it, it, they sometimes take a while to preview, and each of these you can you know click to, to preview them or you can download them. All right. Um, chapters often have optional things for you to view just for your enjoyment and uh, interest. And so I don't ask questions from I, I, from these videos. So there they are indeed optional. And then lastly, at the bottom of each page, there's links to the Launchpad. Um, assignments that you do have. All right. So um, do note you have you have uh, the the learning curve assignment and the first chapter quiz questions due by the end of 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Friday. And again, I have things due often on Fridays for you guys at five because hey, I don't want to you know why not at midnight? I don't want to wreck your night. I don't want to wreck your Friday night. Why not Sunday at midnight? I don't want to wreck your weekend. So you get this stuff out of the way, and then you're kind of clear with me for the weekend. All right, that's the deal. All right, so enjoy Chapter 1, and feel free to jump in and start Chapter 2 when you are done with that. So um, there's Chapter 2 contents down there. On the Go back to the home page and find Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is on, on the brain called Neuroscience and um and uh, great stuff there. Whoops, that's not ready for you to do yet, but it'll open up soon. All right? So um, have a great week, and uh, hit me up if you got any questions. Don't hesitate to email me. And if you'd like to chat sometime, um, invite me to chat. We can get together on, 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 the Canvas, um, on the Canvas conferences, or we can WebEx together, and we can do that with video like this, or we can just do it... Um, with you know if you don't want to pop in there we can be in and use it like a telephone too all right so have a great week and i'll see you next time bye now <laughs>